No matter how many generations come and go, people still have a God-shaped void in their lives. The six-hour series, Winsome Witnessing, will inspire and prepare you to be an effective soul winner. Now join Pastor Gary Gibbs as he presents Part 1, Witnessing Must Be Winsome and Taming Your Nerves. Hello, I'd like to welcome you to Winsome Witnessing, where we are learning dynamic ways to share your faith. I'm glad you're joining us for this session of How to Share Christ with Others Around You. Winsome Witnessing is an important title to this session because if witnessing is going to be effective, it has to be winsome. And winsome witnessing will win some people to Christ. You know, we all have heard about witnessing that is not very winsome. You know, witnessing that makes you want to run the other way. These horror stories of somebody that's just kind of Bible bashing you right in your face. I remember as a uh, non-Christian, growing up as a non-Christian, my sister was converted. She became a Christian. And I would go out on the town and party half the night, and I would come home. My mother was sound asleep in bed, but my dear Christian sister, she had the light on waiting for her wayward brother. And she would meet me at the door, and my eyes would be all bloodshot because of all the stuff I was drinking and smoking. And she would say, where have you been? What have you been doing? Don't you know that stuff's going to ruin your life? Now, she was right in everything she said, but she had me scared half to death. <laughs> and I didn't want her God, and I didn't want to go to her church because she was putting me on this great big guilt trip. Now, did I need to feel guilty? Yes. But she had one of these confrontational, in-your-face witnesses. You know, it's like this cartoon I found. There's this man who's waiting in the mall. His wife is shopping. And this Christian is going around passing out uh, tracts. And most of these Bible tracts are talking about the last days and Jesus is coming. And if you don't give your heart to Jesus, you're going to burn in hell forever. And so this man, this Christian, walks up to this non-Christian and he says, Sir, while your wife is shopping, perhaps you would like to read this and prepare to die. And you know, a lot of times that's the way our witness is. It actually has negative overtones. It's, hey, if you don't follow God right now, you're going to die. Well, who wants to talk to somebody that's telling them they're getting ready to die? You might be some psycho murderer or something. I don't want to talk to you long. And so our witness has to be positive if it's going to be a proper witness. Look at Acts chapter 16 with me, verse 17. Here's a witness that was not a winsome witness. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. There was this woman following Paul and Silas, and she shouted out to everybody, These men are the servants of the Most High God. They show unto us the way of salvation. Is there anything wrong with what this woman said? No, she was right. These men were the servants of the Most High God. They were showing unto everyone the way of salvation. But... While there was nothing wrong with what she said, who was she really witnessing to? Was it God or was it for Satan? You know, she said the right thing, but notice who she was witnessing for. In Acts 16, verse 18, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, this woman was giving a witness, and it was the spirit that was moving her, but it wasn't God's spirit moving her. It was a demonic spirit. In fact, if you read a few verses up, it says this lady had the spirit of divination, the spirit of demons. And the demon was quite content to say the right things, to announce these men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, that tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us the devil doesn't care if we're saying the right things as long as we're saying it in the wrong way because he knows he'll win the battle. That's why, friends, it is imperative that we be winsome witnesses, that we learn how to represent Christ in such a way that what we say and how we say it harmonize and have the most effective witness for Jesus. I like what this writer says in the book Testimonies, Volume 4. The manner in which the truth is presented often has much to do in determining whether it will be accepted or rejected. You see, how we present the truth makes all the difference in the world. I once pastored a church that had uh, 
In fact, I helped develop, they helped me develop the Winsome Witnessing Seminar in that church. And I kind of got an idea that I needed to do this early on in my pastorate there. They had a social event. It was a big outdoor event and all the church members went to it. And in fact, the person hosting the social event invited their neighbors to it. And I remember as I was kind of meandering around, they had a big bonfire and different games and things going on. I was just going around from group to group, getting acquainted. There was this one particularly large group, and they were having this very animated discussion. And I kind of went over there. I was kind of sorry later that I went over there because the host of this big event said, Pastor, come here. I want to introduce you to my neighbors. He said, I've been telling them that they're going to be lost if they don't, if they don't accept the message of truth. They need to accept the truth or they're going to be lost. Pastor, tell them I'm right. Well, I felt like crawling under a log somewhere. That's not my method of witnessing. You know, this poor couple who were their neighbors, they just were surrounded by all these Christians and they they didn't have anywhere to run to. (laughs) And here they were being put on the spot. Obviously, this man did not know how to have a winsome witness. I was at another member's home and we were eating lunch together. And a bunch of us over after church, and we were eating lunch together, and the doorbell rang. And he went and answered the door, and there was a man who had been working on his house. It was a new home, and it was the contractor who built the home. And there were still a few things left undone, and he came by to check to see if his men had followed up on this stuff. And here's what my member told this man. And I won't do it exactly like I heard it. He said, I told you, don't come by here on this day. This is my day I go to church. Don't you know that we're to keep this day holy? You don't have any business being by my house. Now, I never want to see you here again. And I was just kind of sitting over on the couch, just kind of sinking into the couch. And the man said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, I apologize. I I won't be by here again. Of course he wasn't. What type of witness was that for our church? In fact, this was the same man who wanted me as the pastor every Sabbath to have an affirmation of faith. Now, do you know what an affirmation of faith is? In his mind, here's what it was. He wanted us to repeat the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, every Sabbath, as a congregation. I said, why do you want to do that? He said, well, I want people, guests, to know why we are here on the Sabbath. I thought, excuse me, (laughs) don't they know why we're here? If they're here, they know. Why do we have to repeat the fourth commandment every week? He didn't think he had church unless we repeated the fourth commandment. I never gave in. Now, he had a high value for the Sabbath commandment, didn't he? But he was shoving it down that man's throat that came to his door that day. That is not a winsome witness, brothers and sisters. That's not the way God wants us to be. We have to be winsome witnesses if we're going to be God's witness. Here's what God feels about these unwinsome witnessings. From the book Testimonies, Volume 1. God is angry with those who pursue a course to make the world hate them. If a Christian is hated because of his good works or for following Christ, he will have a reward. But if he's hated because he does not take a course to be loved, hate it because of his uncultivated manners, and because he makes the truth a matter of quarrel with his neighbors, and takes a course to make the Sabbath as annoying as possible to them, He is a stumbling block to sinners, a reproach to the sacred truth. And unless he repents, listen to this, it were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he were cast into the sea. (laughs) Do you like that? The Lord believes in jewelry, millstones. (laughs) For those who don't know how to witness, who make a quarrel the truth with their neighbors. Here, you need need a necklace. Here's a millstone. And we're just going to throw you in the sea and be done with you. You know, God gets angry with people who stand in the way of the conversion of others. And it happens. Continue in reading here. No occasion should be given to unbelievers to reproach our faith. We are considered odd and singular and should not take a course to lead unbelievers to think us more so than our faith requires us to be. Listen, we're different enough that we don't need to look any different than we already are. We need to be winsome witnesses if we're going to be God's witnesses. And it's partly because of this negative image of witnessing that a lot of people don't even witness. You know, when I first became a Christian, this guy took me under his wings and he said, Hey, let's go out witnessing. Well, I was so naive, I didn't know what I was getting into. He grabbed his guitar, grabbed me, we went out, went up to the first door, rang the doorbell. 
And he had his guitar strapped on. They answered the door. He said, hi, my name is, we're going to sing you a Christian song today. Strum, and he started singing. I felt like a retard there. You know, number one, I could not sing. Number two, this guy was so eccentric, he was making me look like a nut. And I thought, what am I out witnessing like this? This is not me. You know, and it's those eccentric views of witnessing, those eccentric examples that scare a lot of us away from ever being a witness. You know, it's like if, if you walk into a, a room and you say, uh, hey, let's go witnessing. I'm taking volunteers. Anybody want to go witnessing? It gets real quiet. And then people say, you know, I've got an appointment. I've got something else to do. And they, you can clear a room just saying you're going to go witnessing. You know, the look you see in people's eyes when you go up to them, you know, the most fearful look you ever see in a person's eyes, it's not right before they're going to die. It's right before they're going to witness. It's when the personal ministries leader of a church corners them and says, hi, I want to train you how to witness. It's the look I've seen when I'm driving down a dark country road and I come around a bend in the road and my headlights are out there on the road and there's this little possum sitting there in the middle of the road. Now, possums are so ugly, they're cute. They have these beady eyes and they're looking at you and they're wondering, is this car going to run right over the top of me? And that's what they feel like, people feel like when you're getting ready to take them out witnessing. Is this going to kill me or what? It's uncomfortable. I want to be the type of witness that when I go out witnessing, people love to see me coming. They don't get wide-eyed and scared, but they, they welcome me. And that's what winsome witnessing is all about. And so I want to start right here as we begin this course. I want to ask you a question. Do you get nervous when you think about witnessing? Let me see your hands. Does it make you nervous? It makes a lot of us nervous. It gets us biting our nails. In fact, if I haven't been out witnessing whatever that might look like in a long time, I even get nervous. I think, oh no, I'm getting ready to talk about Christ. It should be so natural to talk about Christ that it shouldn't make us nervous, but it does. Now, who do you think it is that makes us nervous when it comes to witnessing? Satan. It really is. It is Satan. But, you know, we get nervous. And why do we get nervous? Let me ask you, what are you nervous about? What is it that makes you nervous? Rejection, okay, you're afraid you'll be rejected. Anybody else? Lack of knowledge. Might say the wrong thing. How about questions? All these things. I might say the wrong thing. I don't know enough. And I might be rejected. All these things make us so nervous that we say we're not going to do it at all. So let me start right here with dealing with the nerves. Let's talk about how to tame your nerves. Because if you don't settle the nervousness issue, you're never going to get out there and witness. First, you just need to recognize everyone gets fearful. We're all afraid of not knowing what to say or saying the wrong thing. We're all afraid that we don't have sufficient knowledge. But we don't really have to worry about that. Let me tell you why. Many years ago, I was giving studies. Uh, some friends and I were giving studies to a man by the name of Bob. Bob was a brand new non-Christian. First studies he was taking. And he was learning. He was just eating up the Word of God. It was changing his life. He used to be impatient. He used to curse. Now he had patience. He had a clean mouth. And he worked a, a night shift at a grocery store stocking the shelves. And it was just all guys working. And some of the talk would be kind of loose language at night. His co-workers noticed that Bob was changing. His language was clear, clean and clear. He wasn't impatient like he was before. And they said, Bob, what's, what's happened to you? And Bob said, well, I'm taking Bible studies. Jesus has come into my heart. And they said, wow. Now, a couple of people, you know, derided him and joked with him and, you know, said, oh, you're becoming a Jesus freak on us. But there was one guy who said, you know what? Something's happened to Bob, and I'd like to see that happen to me. And so Bob began studies with that person. Now, watch what was happening. Bob was brand new. He was still taking studies from me. One week I'd give a Bible study to Bob. We would open our Bibles together. I'd give him the study material. The next week he would turn around and study it with his co-worker. He was only one step ahead of his co-worker at any given time. I'd study a topic one week. He'd present it the next. He didn't even know where we were going with all this. But he was sharing what he knew. The day came where Bob committed his life to Christ in baptism. And as he, we were baptizing him in one church... His co-worker was being baptized in the next town over in our other sister church. 
Bob was a soul winner before he was even baptized. Bob didn't know a lot, but Bob started with the little knowledge he had. And by starting there, God used him to win someone else. You know, often we think we need to have this huge reservoir of knowledge, that we need to have maybe a, a degree in theology. We need to graduate from the seminary. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you heard somebody with all that knowledge present a very interesting study? You know, if you get into all that Greek and Hebrew and all that complicated stuff, while it can be helpful sometimes, it is not helpful most of the time. Now, I appreciate knowing those languages, but it's like salt. You know, you use salt sparingly. If you fill all your studies with all this complicated stuff, then people are going to choke on it. So you need to be simple, and it's good to be like Bob. Just start with what you have. Share with what the others uh, with what's on your heart. I love this quotation from the book Christ Object Lessons because it gives us courage and not to be nervous. He who begins with a little knowledge in a humble way and tells what he knows while seeking diligently for further knowledge will find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand. The more he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others with a love for souls, the plainer it becomes to himself. The more we use our knowledge and exercise our powers, the more knowledge and power we shall have. Do you see what it says there? All we have to do is begin with how much knowledge? A little knowledge. What do we need to tell others? Tell them what? What we know. And the more we seek to impart light, what will happen? We'll get more light. Now notice we're just seeking to impart light. We might not be giving a lot of light. But if we just try, we get more light in return. And the more we try to explain, the plainer it becomes to us. So turn your attention to the screen. There are conditions mentioned here in this statement. And the condition is we need to begin. We need to just start, even with a little bit of knowledge that we have. Tell what we know. Seek to impart light. And try to explain the word. That's, that's just how you begin. Just get out there. Tell the little bit you know. And then the promise is the whole heavenly treasure will be open to your demand. God will just pour out rich resources to you. You'll receive more light. The word of God will become plainer to you. And you'll have more knowledge and power. How many of you want the whole heavenly treasure open to you? Let me see your hands. How many of you want to know the word of God better? Well, how do you get it? You get it by starting with the little knowledge you have. You know, that little boy who was there on that hillside near the Sea of Galilee, who gave away his few loaves and his few fish, he gave away what little he had, and he was able to sit ringside for the greatest show on earth. He watched thousands fed by his little. And that's what we have to do. We have to start with the little that we have, and God will bless. These are powerful promises. And I'll tell you, I've tested them. I found them true. When I first gave my, I gave my first Bible study, I had no clue where I was going with the next one. But I began with the little knowledge I had, and God kept blessing me and kept giving me more knowledge. Sadly, though, a lot of people don't start with what they have. Listen to this sobering statement from my favorite book, The Desire of Ages. It's on the life of Christ. There are those who for a lifetime have professed to be acquainted with Christ, yet who have never made a personal effort to bring even one soul to the Savior. You can know Christ your whole life, but never bring one soul to the Savior. They leave all the work for the minister. He may be well qualified for his calling, but he cannot do that which God has left for others to do in the church. You see, if we wait for the ministers to finish the work to win lost souls to Christ so we can go home, we're going to be here a long time, my friends. You know, the Bible says... God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should what? Come to repentance. How do people come to repentance? The Bible says in the book of Romans, they come to repentance when they hear the word of God, when the Holy Spirit convicts them. So if people are not going to perish, they're going to be saved. Somebody has to take them the word of God. Somebody has to lead them to repentance. And if we're waiting for the pastors to do it, we might as well just uh, settle in, get our pillows and get real comfortable. Let me give you an illustration of why I say this. We're sitting in, in this city, Sacramento, California. And my, my numbers might not be totally accurate, but just for illustration purpose, let me share this with you. The general population of this area is 1,750,000 people. And generally speaking, there are about 20 pastors in the area. 
If we were waiting for the pastors to reach every single one of these 1.75 million individuals, each pastor would have to reach 87,500 people. That's a lot of work, isn't it? 87,500 people. How long would it take a pastor to do that? It would take years and years and years to do that. In fact, over 200 years. <laughs> and I've never met a pastor that lived that long. I've met some old pastors in my day, but never any that lived that long. You know, we're going to be here a long time, and meanwhile, more people are being born. But what if you took the members, say there are 8,000 members in this area of our church, and they all went out, and they began sharing with this 1.75 million individuals. Do you know how long it would take for us, 8,000, to reach that one and three-quarter million? We could do it in a little over a year. We could do it in a little over a year. But you know what's happening? We're sitting around waiting for the professionals to do it. And we're going to be here forever if we do that. Because we're keeping those professionals busy holding our hands and taking care of us. We need to get out there and we need to become active witnesses. That's why we need to tame our nerves. That's why we need to be involved in sharing the faith with others. And you know it's not hard to do. We're going to talk about specific strategies of how to do this. But it begins with just having a heart for lost people. Having a heart for them and praying, God, use me. I remember one day I was, uh, I was working. I was tree planting, planting trees in Florida. And, and the uh, lumber companies would have us plant trees. And then they would come back and harvest them, make pulp wood out of them. And we would plant 3,000 trees a day. And boy, you were moving. You were paid piecework, too, so you were motivated. Three cents a tree. Well, back then, $100 a day was pretty good living, so we'd plan all day. Well, at the end of the day, you would be absolutely filthy because you're out there just planting these trees, just going through the brambles and the bush. It happened to be a Friday afternoon, and we would end our work about midday Friday so we could get ready for the Sabbath that was coming up. And this particular Friday, we were way back in, the, in this uh, brushy area, and I caught a ride with a friend of mine who was, had his own truck, and that way I didn't have to drive out with the crew. He, he drove me out to the main highway, and he said, Gary, you know, I've, I'm going this direction to the right, to town. And I said, well, I need to go back to our home. I need to get some things ready before I go to town. And I said, why don't you just drop me here, and I'll wait for the crew truck. I was a little disappointed because I wanted to get a head start on my Sabbath preparation. And then an idea crossed my mind as I was standing there on the highway. And I don't recommend this, but I thought, you know, maybe somebody will give me a ride. I'll just hitchhike. So I walked to the other side of the highway. Now, I was an unlikely candidate to be picked up. I was filthy dirty. And I stuck out my thumb and a car pulled over. Here's why you don't hitchhike. This car was a fancy sports car. And I opened the door and the guy's got his rock music. Boom, 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 boom. And I said, <laughs> above the din of the, quote, music, I said, you know, I'm going right up the road. Can you give me a ride? It wasn't too bright back then. He said, yeah, hop in. So I got in. We're driving up the road. And he opens up the console between us. And he says, uh, hey, I've got some marijuana here. You want to get high? And I said, no, man, I found a high better than that. Boy, he thought I had some really good drugs. He closed it. He said, whip it out, man. I said, well, listen. I found something better than that stuff. I used to do that stuff. What I found is much better. He, he was getting more interested all the time. He said, what is it? I said, turn down the music. He turned down the music. I said, it's Jesus. I said, I found that Jesus gets you high and he doesn't let you down. I said, listen, we're living in the last days and it's, we need to get rid of that stuff. We need to get ready for Jesus coming. And he said, you mean people are marrying, getting divorced, marrying, getting divorced, and Jesus is going to come? I said, where did he come up with that? But yeah, it's in the Bible, yeah. I said, yeah. And so, you know, there we are driving down the road. It's just a short drive. And I said, oh, here's, here's where I get off. And I was just hoping and praying he was going to pull over and let me off. So he pulls over. And I thought, what do I do with this guy? Now, I was a brand new Christian. I didn't know how to witness. Today, I do some other creative things. But the thought came to my mind, give him a book. You know, if you don't know what to do, always give somebody literature. And I said, hey, if you've got a moment, come into uh, my house here and I'll give you a book and you can study about this. And he kind of looked down and he said, you know, I'd love to do that. He said, but I quit school quite young. He said, I can't read. 
What do you do with somebody you're never going to see again, they can't read, and the Internet was not invented then? (laughs) At least we didn't know about it. I just thought, well, tell him where he can go to church to find the truth. And I said, you know what? I found that in the church that I now attend, the Seventh-day Adventist church, they really know the Bible. And if you'll look up the Seventh-day Adventist church, they'll teach you the Bible and you'll learn these things. And boy, when I said that, he lit up, he smiled, and he put out his hand, he said, put it there. And I was putting it there, wondering why I was putting it there. And, and he said, I was born and raised a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I had the same reaction. Wow. And then I gave him a sermon. I don't recommend this, but it just kind of came pouring out. I said, you were born and raised a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? He said, yeah. I said, what are you doing with that pot there? I said, I left that stuff. I was born, raised in the world, a non-Christian, and I was doing that stuff. And I found it doesn't take me anywhere good. I left it behind, and I joined the church, and I crossed you as you were coming out? I said, something's wrong with this picture, man. I don't know what you saw growing up in church, but this church understands the Bible better than anybody else. I recommend you get back to it. And we had prayer together. I'll never forget what this man said as I... As the door was closing, I just said, you need to go find a church. As the door was closing, he said to himself, it's been a long time, a long, long time. I hope to see that man in heaven one day. I wish I would have done some other things. I wish I would have taken his name and address and gotten him signed up with Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides or something. But the Lord used me in spite of my little knowledge. Because I was praying, Lord, use me today. Divine appointments, they're all around us. And we don't need to worry about how much information we have and how good we are at witnessing. All we have to do is answer the question, are we willing to be used? Are you willing to be used? If you're willing to be used, you don't need to consult your fears. You don't need to consult your nerves. You know, just go out there. Let let your knees knock a little bit. Let the voice quiver. You might even be able to dance to it. You get the knocking well and quiver going really well. But you just need to get out there and look for those divine appointments. God will give them to you. And you will find that God will use you in a mighty way. How many of you want to be used by God? Let me see your hands. He will use you. Start praying. And as you pray, God will lead you to people that He has just for you. Just like Jesus, one day he's walking through town and he walks up to a tree and he looks up and lo and behold, there's a man up in the tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down for I'm going to your house today. Jesus had never met Zacchaeus before, but God knew exactly where Zacchaeus was and arranged a divine appointment that transformed his life. And I hope to see Zacchaeus in heaven one day. God has somebody out there just for you to meet. And if you will begin praying and allow God to use you, you will meet them. And your assignment is, this week, let God give you a divine appointment. May God bless you. Join us next time for Winsome Witnessing Part 2, Winning Them Without Killing Them, and Remedy for Laodicea.